Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever it is for you. For me, it's just past midnight on Tuesday, October the 8th, which makes this the news for Monday, October the 7th, 2024, day 958 of Vladimir Putin's war of aggression against the people of Ukraine. How do you do? I'm Peter Alexievich, and this is the Live at Five from Kiev bringing you all the latest news and happenings from on the ground here in Ukraine. And I see that the peeps are starting to come in. Part is here. Robert Chapman is here. Anthony Tommy Tom. Hey, Cheyenne. Hey, PT. Hey, PH. How's everybody doing? Hey, Eli. Frisk Luft. How you doing? Hey, Fitz. Evening, everyone. Hey, super user. How's everybody doing tonight? Hey, Yorkshire T. Renee Herman. Stuart McKenzie, how do you do? Nice to see you, Stuart. Thanks for dropping by. It was a hell of a weekend here in Kiev, boy. I'll tell you, Stuart, you missed the bangs and the booms. You really did. Hey, Rocco. The So last night, the Russians... Now, this is in addition to, I want to point out, this is in addition to the 94 aerial glide bombs that slammed into Ukraine today. In addition to that, overnight last night, we had a 10-hour uh, missile and drone attack. It was a 10-hour air raid. Now, that's huge, huge. And even when it was done, it wasn't done. Um... The numbers from the overnight air raid were published this morning. Uh, territorial defense shot down 56 of 75 Shahed drones of the 131-136 class. They shot down two out of three missiles. And a scander got through, hit the port of uh, Yazuni, uh, which is in Odessa. Hit a ship there that the Russians claimed was, a, was a, an ammunition armed supply ship. Now, is that impossible? I mean, I guess it's not impossible. At the time that it was hit by the Iskander missile, its Egyptian and Libyan crew flying under a St. Kitts flag from the Caribbean, uh, they had 6,000 tons of corn on board, is what they had on board when they were hit. Now, could they have brought weapons into Ukraine? I mean, I guess maybe they could have, but why? Could they have brought weapons into Ukraine? I mean, I guess maybe they could have. But why? Why would you risk it when there's trains from Poland that have never been interdicted by the Russians? Why would you risk bringing shit in on ships? It doesn't make any sense. So the Russians claim that it was a, an arms-carrying ship, even though it was loaded with 6,000 Tons of grain is my understanding. 6,000 tons of corn specifically. Again, flying under a St. Kitts and Nevis uh, flag with a mostly Egyptian and Syrian crew. No reports of anybody unalived in that attack. So the Iskander got through the KH-59 and one unknown rocket was shot down last night. Now, again, we're hearing this from Ukrainian armed forces that they're shooting down these missiles of an unknown type. Now, what could that be? What does that mean? Um, it, it can only mean one of two things. Either the Russians have created some new weapon and it's not categorized by the Ukrainians. Or I think um, um, a simpler answer is that these rockets are the Iranian Foth 360s. And for whatever reason, the Ukrainian armed forces, for some reason, doesn't want to identify them publicly yet. That, that's the only thing I can think of. Now, we'll see, time will tell whether or not that's true. So we had this huge 10-hour missile and drone attack last night. There were, air defense was active all night long. The air raid siren went off at least four times between 8 o'clock last night and uh, 8.30 this morning. And this morning, after we thought it was all done, 
two Kinzals, hypersonic missiles, come uh, flying at Kiev. Now, obviously, the large attack last night was intended to exhaust air defense. It did not succeed because both of the Kinzhal missiles fired at Kiev this morning were shot down in explosions that were so big, even though they were nowhere near my house, the building shook from boom, 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 uh, from the explosions in near space. Uh, debris fell on the city of Kiev, causing some fires, um, but there were no injuries, uh, no reports of death in the capital last night. Uh, happening right now, the port of Odessa is being hit with ballistic missiles. Uh, we know that the missiles have come in. We know that they've hit the port. We don't yet have reports of casualties or of damage, but that's happening right now. They're under, or I don't know, is Ant here? Has that air alert been uh, raised yet? If Ant's here, maybe he can tell us, although Odessa may not have power. Okay. Um... Russia shot down its own $15 million unmanned prototype drone, the Sukhoi 70. This is an airplane-sized unmanned aerial vehicle. It's the size, it looks to be about the size of uh, an American uh, stealth fighter. You know, the one that looks like a bat. It's supposed to be stealth, but it doesn't look like it's stealth. Um, the idea behind it is that it's got long range and can carry heavy mun munitions. It's estimated to be able to carry between 1,000 and 3,000 kilograms of high explosive materials. So for some reason, it's unclear why uh, the, uh, the Russians have two of these prototype aircraft and they appear to have sent one into battle. Only, according to reports, they lost communication with it. They were afraid that it would come down in Ukrainian space and fall into Ukrainian hands. And so they sent one of their own jet fighters to intercept it and blow it out of the sky. Um, the only thing is they blew it out of the sky over Ukraine by the time they decided to pull the trigger. Apparently, it was already over Konstantinivka. And so the debris is all in the hands of the Ukrainians, which means it's in the hands of the Americans and the British. And analysis will be conducted, forensic analysis of this machine to determine its capabilities will be un undergone. You can be sure of that. So we'll know more about this thing as the American and British forensic teams tear it apart, I would think. Uh, I mean, the claim, Dark Irish, is that it's a sixth generation technology. Stealth, unmanned, hypersonic, blah, blah, blah. Right, so it's bullshit, of course, right? There's nothing stealth about it. I mean, you can see ex exposed rivets on the skin of the plane. You can see the the unflushed Philip head screws on there. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. Anyway, that's what their, their claim is now. Uh, in a really harrowing turn of events, it appears, or at least there's a lot of evidence to indicate that it is now Russian policy to summarily execute prisoners of war on the battlefield. We are seeing, the, the Russians just seem absolutely intent on videotaping their war crimes and posting it to the internet. We saw it with the guy that they executed with a sword. This week we had awful video of the psychological torture of a, of a Ukrainian soldier and then ultimately his execution by firing squad. Um, this is all coming. So what they're saying is that 80% of all POWs executed by the Russians have happened in the last nine months. 
80% of all POWs executed by the Russians have happened in the last nine months. And they've happened everywhere, all up and down the line. It doesn't look like a, an individual one-off kind of thing. It looks much more like a, a consistent policy of war crimes. Hey, Robbo. Did they nightshade? Good. The prosecutor's general's office undoubtedly has a, a file on that guy. Hey, Wanpa. Um, this is all coming on the heels of the announcement from the GRU that uh, 177 POWs, Ukrainian POWs, have died while in Russian custody. Um, and the UN report that says that the torture of Ukrainian POWs is endemic and systemic. It is everywhere and it is sanctioned by Russian command. This is who we're dealing with. These guys are hunting humans with drones on the streets of Kherson every day. 60 to 100 drones are tracking down mothers on bicycles out for a ride with their kids. Uh, families in their cars trying to get food in the house. The Russians are hunting civilians with drones in Kherson, and it is both a crime and a sin. Overnight, Ukraine struck the uh, main, uh, the marine oil terminal in Fedosia, as well as Belback and Saki airfields. Now, we don't have reports on the damage, on any damage at Belback or Saki, but we do have reports that the marine oil transport hub in Fedosia is burning uh, along that the pipeline was hit there, the storage oil tanks were hit there. And this place has been hit before by Ukrainian drones. Uh, so much so, in fact, that the air defenses for the location were upgraded to include a long-range S-300 battery and a short to mid-range Panzer battery. So there was layered air defense over this oil depot and terminal, and the Ukrainians still managed to get through. There's no word yet on whether the Panzer and the S-300 were also targeted as part of the attack on the oil depot. But the NASA firm's data is clear. The place is burning. It's burning um, all across the territory of the marine terminal. Now, there is one other of these main petroleum distribution hubs. It's in Sevastopol, but it's unclear whether that's being used as an emergency reserve and oil isn't flowing through it. Uh, and it's basically shut down for that. It's just being held as a strategic reserve or if it's actually in use, it's, it's not clear. There's no ships coming and going to and from Sevastopol. That much is true. Uh, soldiers of the Wings Special Unit of the HUR, the Ukrainian General Intelligence Directorate, uh, discovered and destroyed a Russian WASP air defense system. This is a $10 million anti-air system. And the drone that destroyed it, less than $1,000. So a $1,000 drone took out a $10 million uh, air defense system. Now, that is not the only air defense system hit over the weekend. Uh, a $15 million Book M2 radar system was taken out in the Kharkiv direction, while in the east, in the Donetsk region, a Tor M2 uh, short-range, medium-range uh, air defense system and an OSA short-range air defense system were also taken out. So the more and more excellent ROI, Cheyenne, right? I mean, really, that's the kind of return on your investment you want to see. Hey, Dan Ballard, how you doing? Uh, so really good hits across the weekend. You know, you're talking about uh, $100 million dollars in radars, air defense uh, systems alone, alone. Uh, yesterday, the UA, the Ukrainian armed forces engaged Russian forces in 99 combat clashes all up and down the front line. 
The heaviest fighting was in the Pokrovsk, Le Mans, Turetsk, Korakova, and Volchansk directions, right? And basically in Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, in the Pokrovsk direction, the ISW is estimating that the Russians have lost in the 32 minute in the 32 months they've been pushing toward Pokrovsk five divisions uh, of armored vehicles, including tanks. Visually confirmed, the ISW says that they have that the Russians have lost. 500, is that right? 535 tanks. That's one and a half divisions. 1,020 infantry fighting vehicles. That's four to five divisions. Now, these are only the confirmed losses. The losses are likely higher than this because this has all been visually confirmed by open source intelligence. I mean, the losses are just staggering, absolutely staggering. Hey, Sergey. Hey, Jay. Um, let's see. Now, in Vovchansk, while all up and down the front line, the Russians are advancing um, to the point where in September they took 0.1% of Ukraine. They give them credit. Credit were credit, uh, unless you subtract what the Ukrainians took in curse, then the Russians actually lost land, but that's okay. We'll give it to them 0.1% of Ukraine in the month of September, uh, but with the largest casualties on record for a month. Well, there's some debate on that. I reported on Friday that some Western officials were saying that September was the second deadliest month for Russia, but the ISW numbers out today I'm sorry, not ISW, uh, Ukrainian military intelligence update today said no, September was the deadliest month for the Russians. So a little bit of fog of war there, but no matter how you cut it, this is not going well and it's certainly not going according to fucking plan. That's for sure. So in Vlog Chance, the, the Ukrainian armed forces continue to advance. The Russians are being consistently pushed back toward the international border. Um, not that there's anything uh, left of the town of Vovchansk. Not a thing. Let's see now. The IT Army of Ukraine uh, is conducting a cyber attack against Russian media facilities today. Russia TV1 and Russia TV24, among others, are unable to broadcast online. Internal services are down uh, with no phone or internet services in offices for any of these media companies. It's reported that uh, the servers and backups that these companies depend on for their business uh, have been wiped and are unrecoverable. That, that would be Ukraine's birthday present to Herr Putin, I think. Today, Putin turned 72 years old. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, we don't, we don't age as a species. We don't tend to age gracefully. We tend to kind of age all at once. It happens over a very short period of time. Um, and I'll tell you, my father, between 72 and 75, he changed. And yeah, Sergey, let's pray he never sees 73. I'm with you, pal. I'm with you there. It cannot be going well for him. It just can't be. Uh, Andriy Kovalenko, head of the Ukrainian uh, Center for uh, disinformation says that uh, North Korean engineers or ammunition specialists were sent in to monitor and diagnose the higher rates of failure of North Korean ammo 
that Pyongyang sold to Moscow. So everybody knows because we've made fun of it here, right? Hey, Samso, we've made fun of it here. Literally half of the North Korean ammo either doesn't fire, is a complete dud, or uh, blows up en route to the target, or fails to hit the target and doesn't detonate either, right? Fully half of the ammo falls into one of these categories. <clears throat> so apparently Moscow expressed its displeasure to Pyongyang. And Kim, in good po political fashion, said, I don't know what you mean. What could you mean? We sell you good stuff. We sell you the good stuff. Let me send my men. Your guys are probably storing the shit wrong or damaging it in transit. Let me send my guys and they'll analyze it. So these field engineers are out there in the field getting, uh, you know, basically filing bug reports. Every time the ammo goes off or fails to go off, they file a report. Well, six of the officers that were running this thing were unalived in an attack last week. And three more of the workers, three of the engineers were injured. Now, at the time, we all thought that they were there as like reconstruction crews in Mariupol and stuff. Cheap labor, slave labor, let's be honest. Slave labor for the, for the Moscow regime. Um, but it appears that instead... They are there to try to make it up to the Russians as to why their shit don't work and to report back home to the boss why things are in rough shape with Korean ammunition. Um, Victor uh, Booth, 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 Victor Booth uh, is denying charges. Now, this guy, if the name is not familiar to you, you might be familiar with his moniker, Putin's Merchant of Death. This is the guy that the U.S. had locked up for about 10 years that Putin wanted back real bad. He was an international arms dealer that uh, we had in custody for a long time, for a decade. And Putin wanted him back. So what did he do? He took Brittany Griner hostage and some other people hostage. And we traded Griner and the other hostages for this Victor Booth. Um, this was probably about a year ago. Well, it appears that Victor may be back to work in his old job. It may be that he is brokering the arms deals with the Houthi rebels in Yemen, trying to get some uh, Russian missiles down there so that they can interdict U.S. and European ships in the Red Sea, right? You got that choke point of the Suez Canal. The Houthis have a clear shot into the Red Sea. You give them some good missiles and they can do a lot of damage to international trade. Now, again, I want to repeat, Victor Booth is denying these claims. He is saying he's a reform man. He's not involved in that anymore. <laughs> no, I'm sure he's not. I'm sure that that's exactly not why Putin wanted him back so badly. Uh, the Netherlands uh, have confirmed 400 million euros invested into the drone program for Ukraine. Now, 200 million of that, they're going to spend on drones built in uh, by the Dutch in the Netherlands. So they'll supply Ukraine with 200 million out of, uh, in out of the box drones. The other 200 million will get sunk into Ukrainian drone manufacture to buy Ukrainian drones for Ukraine. Uh, don't touch our boats. I saw that down there, Fitz. Did you see this about the Alexander Obakov today? The Alexander Obakov is a mine sweeper. Uh, Russia's got eight of them in service, four that are currently being built. And it was docked in Kaliningrad, not in the Black Sea. And oops, somehow water got into the engines Oh, denying me, denying me. Why don't you get a rope behind me? Some water got into the engines and ruined the engines. So seawater got in. Somebody put a screwdriver through some of the seals on the turbines and the compensator, apparently, because the compensator had to be removed. The turbines had to be removed and rebuilt. 
um, before this thing can be back in service again. This was, according to the Ukrainians, a sabotage job by the Ukrainian military directorate, the HUR, right? Budinov's people. Now, again, this is the second case of sabotage of a Russian warship in the port of Kaliningrad, thousands of kilometers away from the the conflict in Ukraine. And, And it's unclear whether this was an agent of the GUR operating in Kaliningrad or if the Ukrainians just hired some disaffected Russian to do it. It's, it's, we don't know. We may never know. But that also happened today. Uh, it is, or actually it happened on September 4th or October 4th. We just got the video today. Uh, the first Dutch F-16s have also arrived in Ukraine. Um, on Saturday... Three Russian command and control posts were hit in the east with storm shadows and a combination of multi-launch rocket systems. These were the 30, according to reports, this was the 35th and 27th separate motorized rifle brigades of the Russian Federation. Their command and control centers were both hit along with the command uh, HQ for the second combined army of Russia. So these were apparently decapitation strikes meant to take out the general staff that were present there at the time. Stephen J. Hubbard is an American who was living in uh, Izium for 10 years and was a member of territorial defense there during the full scale, the early days of the full scale invasion. He was taken prisoner by the Russians Again, he's an American living in Ukraine, and he has been accused of being a mercenary. He was tried and found guilty in a behind-closed-doors session and has been sentenced to 10 years in the gulag for his crimes against Russia. So another example of Russia's hostage diplomacy, right? They'll want to trade this guy for some other murderous cunt that we have locked up somewhere in the West. Okay. Um, Last thing. Clay, if you're here, you'll love this. So you guys know what a turret toss is, right? When a Russian tank blows up because they're not welded to the chassis, uh, they blow up and, and the turret goes flying through the air. Well, the record for a turret toss to date was 73 meters, but video emerged over the weekend of a turret being tossed 85 meters into the air, Russian Aerospace Program 2, Lars, exactly. That's over 250 feet in the air. Now, those turrets, they weigh a quarter ton or something ridiculous, right? So, obviously, the ammo cache on the thing went, It went exactly the right way. The turret blew almost straight up 85 meters up into the air. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right. So just before we go to Q&A, let me mention that uh, Ballerina is the sponsor of tonight's live. If you see Ballerina around, please thank him. Um, Although I think he's working some overtime these days, so he might not be here right now. Um. I want to thank the moderator team, best moderator team on the Tickety Talk, Cheyenne, Vanetta, PT, Jay, and Travis. And big thanks to uh, Lars, who has the Alexievich archive and the Discord server. Big thanks to Nightshade, who has the Peter's Peeps public group over on the Book of Faces. And uh, to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Vanetta, who is off tonight, but who maintains our Google Doc share where you can get uh, letters to Congress, the Senate, and the White House on all things Ukraine. So uh, having said that, guys, that's all my top-level headline stuff 
for over the weekend and for today. If anybody's got any questions, feel free to chat them in. Some of you may be interested to know this notebook that I've been using since uh, February is full. It's full. I really got used to it. So I'm going to have to get a new notebook now. Did you mention Putin's Sochi house demolished? I did not. I'm unaware that that's the case, Sharon. Where did you see that? Putin's palace in Sochi got hit. I am not aware of that. Come on. It was demolished on purpose. What was demolished? Oh, here we go. Putin's Black Sea Retreat, published six hours ago. Part of Vladimir Putin's summer residence has been demolished with the Russian leader seeming re reluctant to visit. Tears down favorite holiday villa. Putin tears down favorite holiday villa over threat of Ukrainian drones. Wow. So rather than let the Ukrainians demolish it, he took it down himself? How does that make any sense? Ah, Robert Stewart Key. Thanks, pal. I appreciate it. PayPal's in the description. I am going to have to do that. I am going to have to get new pads tomorrow. Some birthday, huh, Darlene? Now, I'm not certain, just browsing the headlines and kind of the top line, I'm not certain that the complex has been demolished, right? I mean, it's not like the Summer Palace is just one building. It's a complex of buildings. Uh, which one of those is the villa? And apparently that's what got torn down is another question. So I don't know. I didn't know about that. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, Ethel read, I don't know whether or not there was a large underground part of that palace. I think that most of those details have been kept secret. Now, uh, things leak. I'm not suggesting that there wasn't a big underground bunker. One would think there would be. But uh, it's demolished. Look at the satellite images of it. He does have loads of property, but he doesn't have many $2 billion uh, compounds. Certainly not with the view that that one had perched over the Black Sea. Um, he's got another similar compound in Tav Tavir, north of Moscow, the Winter Palace, as they call it. And then he's got the uh, retreat out somewhere on the Tiaga, way up in the Arctic Circle, where he breeds those special deer whose antler blood he bathes in to keep young. That's, that's a real thing. Like, that's not a thing I'm making up, right? Go, you know, just Google Putin and antler, deer antler blood. That's crazy. A PH. Now, if there's already satellite images of it, that can't have happened recently. We must have just got news of it. What's not working, Darlene? He 
He does that because wallpaper hanger was already taken. Yeah, Darlene, it's ridiculous. How strong is the position of Putin and is there a chance of a new more Western leader will stand up? No. Putin's position is extremely secure. Things literally have to fall apart for the Russians to take any action. We cannot expect the Russians to take any action. Uh, and there is no left-wing opposition to Putin in Russia. It is entirely likely that the next guy will be much worse than Vladimir Putin was because he will have wrested power from him. And it's going to take quite some doing. Um, however, uh, the good news is that the new guy won't have an army. He may be worse than Putin, but he's going to be much weaker. Hey, you never showed on my FYP. No, I, I don't show on people's FYPs anymore because all the Ukrainian voices are being suppressed. It's just that simple chef deb. Um, I will keep uploading my lives to YouTube. I am going to do that. And I am going to keep doing the lives every Monday through Friday here on this time at this channel. Um, Ukraine seems to mostly be digging in where they are in Kursk fits. The, the progress has slowed, but they are still advancing, but it's much slower than it was. It seems much more like the Ukrainians are digging in where they're at to hold that ground. Now, it's been cold and wet and miserable here all weekend, three days of rain and cold. Um, if, that, if those conditions are happening out on the front line too, Mud season will be here right on schedule. And then everybody's going to have to slow down. Thank God. Hey, I'm on Pablo's FYP today. Nice. Thanks. Yeah, it for a while there, all my videos were being uh, rejected for FYP as not suitable for FYP. I had to appeal every video. Uh, I'm afraid, Chef Deb, I did do the news, yes. Ethel Red, I'm not on the front line, so I can't speak to that. And I'm sure the answer you got for every guy on the front line that you asked that question to, you would probably get a different answer, depending on where they are. I've, I've talked to guys up and down the line, and the, the variety of experiences are as many varied and unique as the individuals on the line. So I, I wouldn't even begin to try to answer that question. Oh, Chef Deb, definitely. So lives are going to continue here on TikTok at this time and on this channel. They'll continue to get downloaded and posted to Facebook. No problem. But I think I'm, going, I'm in a transitional process because my videos don't get any views here. And I am so restricted on what I can say and the language that I can use. And um, that I think I'm going to switch to more just videos on the Patreon. There are a hundred people that support me on Patreon. And you guys are who I work for. You're, you're the, the people that support me, literally. Um, you and the subscribers here on TikTok. And so... I want to be conscious of my commitments to you. And I, th I think I'm going to start making more videos just on Patreon and not as many here because they don't go anywhere. Nobody sees them. 
So why should I make these neutered videos where I can't use the language that needs to be used to describe these situations um, without getting banned? So I don't know. Um, but I, I do hope that folks would join the Patreon. I want to welcome, we had a new Patreon subscriber today, James Aldridge. Thank you, James, if you're around. Um, and I lost a number of subscribers on, on Patreon. So it's getting harder and harder to keep doing this, guys. If anybody out there can join the Patreon and make a long-term commitment toward keeping this channel up and running in me in Ukraine, please, please do so and check the Patreon for updates. The SU-70 that was shot down was shot down by the Russians. So, Flippy, it looks like an SU-25 or maybe an SU... The Russians say it was an SU-57. It doesn't look like it on the videotape. On the videotape, it looks like an SU-25. Uh, comes up behind the drone, shoots it down. It's very dramatic. And this is all being captured by Ukrainians on the ground who are watching this. And as I say, it was shot down over Ukrainian controlled territory. So the bits and bobs and bric-a-brac of it are in the hands of the Ukrainians, which means that the latest and greatest stealth technology from Russia is soon going to be on a forensics table in Dallas, Texas, uh, you can be sure. And in, uh, where's that place south of London that they do that forensic work? That place. Yeah, it's getting, it's, it's really getting difficult to maintain the channel, guys. Um, all the tick, you know, the couple hundred bucks that I was making off of TikTok in last spring, that's all gone. Um, it's, it's nothing. Last week's check was 1837. Um, and then with the loss of some Patreon supporters, it's, it's increasingly difficult. Not so stealth. No, Maddie, not so stealth at all. Mm -mm. Even my trains are not getting seen as much. Your trains? I don't know what that means, Mel. Other questions, comments, points of observation, or personal need? Anything from anybody? Again, big thanks to the moderator team and to tonight's sponsor, Ballerina. We appreciate you. Your train spotting videos. Okay. Hmm. Um, I remember something. I know the Russians are big into hockey. Uh, I don't, I don't remember the details of the hockey thing. No worries. Truth hurts. No worries. Um, I, I don't know anything about hockey, so I don't know the politics of hockey. I don't know that we should be celebrating that. I don't I don't think any Russians should be welcome in American sports right now. I mean, I just I, I don't want to have anything to do with any Russians at all. I really don't. Uh, it's it, you're just you're just asking to get knifed in the back. It's all you're doing. You're just asking to get knifed in the back. 
it's it's a problem. It's definitely a problem. Um, on the subject of getting knifed in the back, I meant to include this in tonight's report. Um, but you guys know wild berries, right? Wild berries is like the, uh, oh, it's like the Russian Amazon. Uh, the Russian, Russian Amazon. And it was started by this woman. The, the power behind the throne is a, is a woman. The brains behind the operation is a woman. And she and her husband run it. Well, they're having a divorce. They're getting divorced. And, you know, Russia is very male patriarchy focused. So the husband feels like he's getting a raw deal. What does he do? He hires a bunch of Chechen assassins and they go into the Wildberry's office in Moscow, shoot the place up in the middle of the day, execute a bunch of the wife's staff as part of their little divorce dispute. Now, I don't know that we can take too much from this. However, there is something about this that is deeply reminiscent of the violent, chaotic 90s in Russia. And it seems like there could be, a, a, again, you can't extrapolate too much from this, but there is the potential for the entire Russian Federation to devolve into warring warlords who think that they can hire their assassins and send them to do their bidding and make the world how they want it to be with no compunction, no conscience, no sense of order or rules-based order, none whatsoever. Just might makes right of the gangster mentality. That's what we're dealing with here. And that's what every poor bastard in Russia has had to deal with and has been unable to find the balls to stand up to for 500 years, 500 years. You had 400 years of serfdom, you had 80 years of the most evil experiment in manipulating human beings, the Soviet Union, and then 30 years of this gangsterism. They, the entire society is sick. You look at a population pyramid for Russia, it's upside fucking down because the society is on a suicide, a societal suicidal course. It's not a society that can be sustained. <coughs> yeah. Most countries have a mafia. In Russia, the mafia have a country. Yorkshire tea, that's bingo. Right on the money, pal. Right on the money. They are literally regressing as a civilization. They're on the verge of losing air travel. They're on the verge, this is a country that's on the verge of losing air travel as a method for getting around. Uh, Bobby, you know, I'm, I was going to mention that actually. I knew about that. Um, but not a lot of people know what CERN is, right? So uh, the Large Hadron Collider or CERN is uh, where they discovered the Higgs boson, a um, bunch of other stuff. And the Russian contingent has been expelled from there. Um, we need to do the same on the International Space Station. Um, the problem is we've become dependent on the Soyuz capsules to get us there and back. <coughs> but no, this, this cooperation with these people, it has to stop. It has to stop. When they were starving in the 90s, we fed them and all it did was breed a nest of snakes that have done nothing but strike at our heels for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. 
there is an increasing use of steam engines in on the railways of the Russian Federation because the electric engines are breaking down and they don't have the parts to repair them. Night, PT. Um, let's see here. Hey, Tony Takiri. How you doing, pal? We got five minutes left, guys. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, chat them in down below. Questions, comments, updates that I've missed, like the CERN thing. I know a little something about CERN. Would you like to hear about it, Bobby? It's 27 kilometers of tunnel underground, designed in mind to send protons around. A circle that passes through Switzerland and France. 60 nations contribute to scientific advance. Two beams of proton swing round through the ring they ride, till in the hearts of the detectors, they're made to collide and all that energy packed in such a tiny bit of room becomes mass particles created from the vacuum. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, that is uh, who does that song? Because that's not an original. I don't want to try to pass it off as my own. That's uh, Alpine Cat. Alpine Cat. <laughs> uh, do you think that time is in favor of Ukraine now? Flippy, that's a great question. I don't. Putin thinks time is on his side. I think he's wrong. I think he's wrong. Beyond that, I mean, this needs to, for the Ukrainian sake, it needs to be over. But it can't be over without a just end. Putin playing for time may be the worst mistake that he's ever made because the situation inside of Russia is deteriorating. And if you let it deteriorate too far, then you reach that tipping point where there's no easy way to come back. And I think there on the precipice of that tipping point right now. And, and in just, what, 30 days, the American elections will finally be over. And if Harris wins, as I think she will, Russia will almost certainly want to begin negotiations right away because they will know it's over for them. Unless Donald Trump, unless they have a coup planned in the United States for Donald Trump to try to win it. And we know that Mike Johnson is working on something, which is very disturbing to me. But we know that Mike Johnson is the worst thing that could happen is that Harris wins by just a tiny amount. Whether popular vote or electoral college doesn't matter. The worst thing that could happen is for there not to be a mandate from the American people for Harris. If there's that on the edge question, there's no telling what he'll do. Johnson's in deep water. Why is that, Fitz? What'd he do? Tell me. I'd love to hear the misery of Mike Johnson. The Kirch Bridge hasn't been destroyed because it doesn't matter. Um, it's taking up huge amounts of resources while the Russians try to protect it uh, and repair it even. Huge amounts of resources being taken up to do that. All in vain, all foolishly, it's all folly. And in the meantime, they can't use it. They can't send military cargo on the rail line. It's too heavy. They can't send it on the, the one open lane for traffic. It's too heavy. So it's effectively useless for military operations, but it provides an easy method of escape from Crimea for civilian traffic. And another Category 5 coming to Florida, huh? 
So the Kirsch bridge is still up because it no longer matters. It's not a priority, is my understanding. MJ is absent from Congress and won't reconvene for FEMA relief. That way they can keep lying to the American people and say that it's the Biden administration that's not acting. I did, Bobby. We talked about the Fredosia oil, uh, the marine oil terminal in Fredosia, central distribution hub for uh, petroleum and petroleum products in Crimea. Uh, burned burned, burned. And that's after they added an S-300 air defense unit and a Panzer air defense unit. Um, yeah, and you know, if the Rush, if the Ukrainians had a lot of storm shadows and ATACMs to spare, you know, they could use it on those kind of glory targets like the Kirsch Bridge. Uh... But until there's a real need to take it down, I think what they want is they want the exodus out of Crimea to keep going. Uh, something like, if, if I'm not mistaken, the pre-war population of Crimea was like 4 million. Then it was reduced to 2 million. And now I feel like it's down to 800,000. Um, but I'd, I'd have to check all that. But I, I think that there's about a quarter of the number of people on the peninsula that were there before the full-scale invasion happened. And that's huge. And in fact, we just got word, right, the official word from military command is that if you have family on the base, you are to send them home to Russia. Elon Musk is a piece of shit. He's absolutely one of the worst things that America could could be, could be giving aid and comfort to. Uh, he is a turncoat traitor and he should be under investigation by the Senate and the House for crimes against the United States government and people and fraud. Yeah, the, the Iranian media saying things is like the Russian media saying things. Who listens? What's wrong with you that you're listening to them? They're never going to tell you the truth. There's never, I mean, come on, you know. Sure, DD, no problem. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, guys, it's 1 a.m. here in Kiev. So I'm going to call it a night. I just found out Dan Ballard actually pointed out to me, I guess the auto translation on my videos, the, the auto closed captioning spells Kiev the Russian way as Kiev, which is kind of interesting to me that the, the TikTok algorithm does that. Not surprising also, by the way. All right, Pug Mahone, thanks, pal. Chef Deb, good night. Um, check, I try to get these posted right after they happen but the rendering sometimes takes a while. And so they don't get posted until the morning after on YouTube. Um, but look for them there. I'm gonna keep posting the lives there. Thanks, Dusty. Oh yeah, I forget Dusty, you're Ukrainian. Night, Flippy, say hello to the wife. Thank you, Cheyenne. The big thanks to the moderator team. Thank you guys. Good night, Russell Kennedy. Good night, Robbo. Good night, Chef Deb. And guys, if anybody out there can, uh, maybe you're a Patreon supporter already, maybe you could increase your membership level, or maybe you've never been a Patreon supporter, but you could afford to kick me five or 10 bucks a month to keep me on the air. That would be great. I sure would appreciate it. Thanks. Make it a great evening.